Now I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Richard Buckland. He's a professor in computer security, cybercrime and cyber terror at the University of New South Wales and a bit of an all-around legend, if you didn't know this already. He's an award-winning academic, educator and internationally recognised thought leader in the cybersecurity and education fields and has served as a director of numerous uh, professional boards, including the Australian Centre for Cybersecurity and uh, the Australian Computer Society's uh, various boards there. Uh, some of you might have seen his videos and lectures on YouTube, uh, including one I quite like called What If We Didn't Mark Students, uh, or perhaps at the opening of uh, the Ed Crunch in 2015. Uh, he's very much sought after and we're super excited about having him here to speak to us today. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, Paul. Well, that was a nice introduction, very hard to live up to. Uh, you are all people who do things. So I'm a professor. <laughs> Why am I here? Uh, What's the point of me talking to you? Um, so I, I have some thoughts about various things that may, might be interesting for us to all talk about and things I think that will be of benefit to us both. I love science fiction. I've always loved science fiction. The thing I like um, most about it, I think, is this notion of if. If this was different, what would happen? If this was different, what would happen? Based on this starting point, where could we go? I really love that. It's very exciting. Ever since, as a child, the ifs were very exciting. There's two films that I think capture that quite well, Sliding Doors and Run, Lola, Run. I don't know if you've seen those, um, but um, I think Sliding Doors has entered um, as a phrase now to stand for that general concept. Uh, I guess almost a butterfly effect type uh, concept that if something changed, if something was just a little bit different, perhaps the world would go on a completely different path. Uh, and that's really interesting. So, look at you all. I can see some of you. You're so important and doing things and you've had successful lives and you've brought about change and helped people. Um, and you are largely um, in industry and you're largely in business and you're largely in doing. And I think sometimes when I was imagining this talk, I, I was thinking, oh, that, that could have been me. I, I, Whenever I talk to someone from IT at my uni, UNSW, I think, oh, I could have done that. But I, I don't just think that. Whenever I'm talking to them, I think, and you could be me. You could have done this. You, you could be an academic or a teacher. It's funny, but universities are places, in my mind at least, where we focus a lot on differences and hierarchies and silos. We have... Um, what are sometimes called service or support staff. And then we have academics and we have students and they're three different cultures that don't really intermingle. And even amongst academic staff, we have the professoriat and we have the, the sort of lower ranked lecturers. And then we have casual staff and tutors. And within our disciplines, we have science and arts and we, we feel that we belong to one tribe and not another. We are so divided and we, we, we really have a strong sense of self, but it's not a very inclusive sense. I suspect it's the same for students too, for some extent. If you're studying medicine, you feel quite different to someone who's studying law. And I expect perhaps in businesses, sometimes it's like that and sometimes it isn't. I did start in business. And I know in large bureaucracies, often there are different levels and they're quite seriously um, you know, viewed by the people inside the system. And you might think if you're a junior person that you're very different to the senior person. So I just want to explore this idea just for a second, this idea of us all being very different and working, although we are in some way similar, working isolated from each other. So the two themes for today that I'd like to talk about are connection and time. So first let's start with connection. It seems to me that although academics and IT staff and university leaders and students all view themselves, or I suspect they all view themselves as quite different groups. When I talk to them, I feel we are very similar and the things we have in common are far greater than the things that separate us. Um, so if we're all in technology, then we, I think we have our greatest strength and probably our greatest weakness is a love of technology, of, of possibility of achieving great new things with 
um, with new devices and approaches and, and platforms and plans and ways of doing things. Uh, it's very seductive. We don't want to stay the same. We want the latest and the newest and we love it. And we are inspired by the possibilities that new things bring us. And we are not standing still. We are grasping eagerly forward into the future, looking for ways of doing things. I sort of think it might be a bit like the military. Um, I'm, now, I'm not speaking firsthand here, but I'm very interested in the military. I've got lots of friends in the military. Um, and for reasons um, that will become apparent later on, I teach my students quite a lot about some of the ideas that the military has introduced into a way of thinking about groups, organization, and security. Um, oh, I teach computer security, by the way. And it seems to me that from the inside, people in the army probably think they're quite different to people in the Navy and probably think they're quite different to people in the Air Force. And they probably, and all, all the Marines, say, in America. You probably belong to your group and view the others with a bit of scorn. But from the outside, they, they're the military. They look very similar to people on the outside. But to the inside, I imagine everyone thinks they're quite different. Um, now, the military sometimes allow civilians in to do things. They sometimes are connections with civilians. Um, so two famous examples I know about are in war games, one of them out of Canada and uh, the other one, um, oh, actually, I can't remember if it was the States or here. I think it was here, the other one, where civilians were allowed, in, I'm sure this happens a lot, there's just two cases I know about. Civilians were allowed into some military war games, civilian thinkers. And I wonder if you can guess what happened. Um, civilians won both times convincingly beat the military experts at the war games isn't that interesting I was speaking to someone in the military about that asking why do you think that happened and they said well maybe we're a bit hidebound and the people that came in weren't so constrained and they jumped around and they thought of new things and they were innovative and they weren't afraid of taking risks and so on and I think maybe that's part of the answer but I don't think that's the whole answer but that was very interesting and it it showed me that there are potential benefits in mixing different groups. And that's, I guess, the theme of the first half of the talk. So what is, oh yeah, I had another example of that. Yeah, I was sort of bragging about my own students because I'm so proud of them. Uh, and no, no, claiming no credit myself. Um, last year, there's a cyber competition run every year where the students from around the country all compete, all different unis compete uh, in a sort of hacking competition run by the government. And, and, and other organisations at various times have, are involved very heavily as well. And, and we always win, actually. And I say we, <laughs> it's my students. I'm so proud of them. Uh, but it's been about a decade now and we've won every year. And for the first few times that happened, I was so thinking that was fantastic. And, but after a while, I started to get sad about it. Because if you think about it, I don't think it's necessarily that we're doing something right. Um, it, it just seems too big a coincidence to always win. I sort of think that um, there might be a lack of people doing something right elsewhere, that there might be people doing something wrong. And it made me really interested in what are the different ways that people teach cybersecurity? Anyway, last year, the, they didn't run that technical competition for some political funding related reason. I don't know all the details, but Macquarie Uni, good on them, put up an alternative that was a, more a soft skills competition to do with incident response and understanding a, a business compromise. And again, it was a, a war game and people can, uh, can participate. But this time uh, there was a division for industry people to participate as well as a division for students. And the organizer said they had the two different divisions. So the um, uh, you know, so the students wouldn't be disheartened, essentially, because, you know, the experts, experienced people were in the game as well. Uh, and, and our students won again. Uh, and I'm going to talk about that in a sec. And again, it sounds like I'm bragging, but I'm not. I actually want to get to a more fundamental issue that I think is going on here. But the interesting thing was we didn't just win. I keep saying we. They didn't just win. Uh, afterwards, one of the judges came up to me and said, you also beat the industry people. So... How did students beat industry people in war games? That's really interesting. That had me, I was thinking about that really hard for a while. And there's something, again, that's, that's not quite right going on here. And, I, and, I, and no, I won't, I won't jump to that conclusion now. The conclusion isn't all casting glory on us. The conclusion is there is something fundamentally wrong with the idea of war games as well. It's weak in a particular way. Uh, so we'll talk about that in a sec. Okay, so that's the sort of beginning context I wanted to set up, that we are three different groups. And by giving the two war games example, I wanted to suggest that perhaps by mixing the groups together, there's potential benefit. Um, now, students are interesting. 
what are students like? The, I love teaching. I love teaching because I love the students. It's the best job in the world. Uh, students are quite inspiring. I don't know if you've met many or any, but I strongly encourage you to. They are the hope of the future. And I come home, no matter how bad things are with uh, COVID or just in, in life in general, if I've had a class and seeing my students, I just come home and I'm so positive. And lots of my friends are lawyers and they always come home and they're a bit sad because I guess in their job, they're looking at things going wrong. Whereas in my job, education, I always see things going right and hope and potential of the future. Um, students are just astonishing. We couldn't afford to hire them once they graduate. They are so good. But while they're with us, we get to share time with them and it is a privilege and absolutely amazing. So let's think about students. They are just like us. They could grow up and be me and they could grow up and be you. I think we're very similar. So I don't think that's too, too different a path to take. It's not a big wide wide fork there. I think the difference between us and students is time. So uh, you probably know Hawkeye um, Pierce famously once said, uh, uh, comedy is tragedy plus time. I sort of think that we are students plus time. And this idea of time, the second theme of the talk now, I'd like to think about what is it that happens over time that turns students into us? Bear with me, because this probably seems a bit tangential. You're probably thinking, what the heck is Richard talking about? Um, <laughs> uh, but hopefully it will become apparent in a second. So what is time? I just want to talk a little bit about the idea of education transforming people. So what do we do when we are educated, when we were students ourselves, or what do our students experience? Um, I guess the initial thought that most people have when they start teaching is a good education is assimilating facts and ways of learning facts are really the challenge of how to be a good teacher. And if you can learn the facts faster and more cheaply, perhaps you're a better educational institution. Um, and I guess it's a bit like the matrix, really. You know, and Neo went into that library and he could just plug something in, boom, suddenly he had this and boom, suddenly he had that. And I thought, oh, he's learning martial arts. I'd been there learning philosophy and French and that hard math that I could never quite understand and, and you know, everything. I'd just, I'd just be in that room just shoving things in my head all the time. But I actually think education is not that. I think education isn't just learning facts. Because if it was just learning facts, we wouldn't need universities. We wouldn't need schools. Everything I need to know is on the internet already. There's videos for everything. Wikipedia is pretty good in lots of our fields and the tech fields. We could just teach ourselves everything. For a long time, I wanted to learn a sort of maths, um, uh, topological um, geometry. Uh, and I'd wanted to learn it for a long time. And all the information I need to learn is on the internet. And actually, I even got some people to recommend good videos about it and things that were experts in the field. But you know, 10 years has passed, I've still not learned it. So what is it? What's the difference? And the other thing is, there's a famous study uh, out of the US. Uh, it was out, out of one of the Ivy Leagues. I'm pretty sure it was Harvard. Uh, if anyone's interested, um, message me and I'll give you the link later on. But it's about something called naive physics, where they found physics students and they taught them, uh, 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 they gave them a quiz. And they found non-physics students, so they gave them the same quiz. And those of you that heard me talk a couple of years ago at the SEC Edu conference probably heard this example. But I think it's really telling. They then quizzed the students, uh, they gave the students a quiz and they marked the students at the end. And the students who'd studied physics didn't perform any better than the students who hadn't studied physics, including some who are physics PhD, are like, uh, you know, postgrads. Uh, the question was uh, a simple Newtonian motion. There was a, a weight a lead weight on a string that was swinging, someone cuts the string. And the question is, where does the weight, what's the path of the weight? Draw on the piece of paper the path the lead weight will take after the string is cut. So it's been swinging like a pendulum. The string is cut when it's fairly high up uh, and starting to come back down. What's the path of the object after cutting the string? And there's multiple choice with, with ultimate different paths. And most people got it wrong. And it's very simple, it's just Newtonian. Um, um, motion. There's nothing fancy in it at all. Nothing really that was learned after the 1900s, uh, at the beginning of the 1900s. So why do people get it wrong? And the theory is, th these scholars are studying this for this reason. The theory is that people um, have a naive model of physics that works very well in the world. So if you drop a cup, you can reach out and suddenly grab it before it hits the ground because your brain has an approximate um, notion of how objects move and that approximation is good enough to control your hand and your reflex to reach out and grab the thing so you have a very naive model of physics built into your body essentially um, and it turns out 
that that is a very sticky model. It's hard to get rid of. So even if you learn more elaborate stuff, when you're distracted or confused, you jump back to this naive model. So the problem was, I think, with these physics people who could pass a theoretical physics exam brilliantly, if asked to, that um, when given a problem that looked like a real world problem, they dropped back to their naive model instead of using their learning, which tells me it's not real learning. So here's what I think real learning is. Real learning is when you change, what things that change you, when you become a different person. So if you can just recall different facts at the right time, I don't know that that's learning. That's more than just repeating. Um, and I guess if your education is like mine, a lot of the education was like that. And to the extent that we changed and were transformed by education, it was almost an accident. It almost happened round the edges or being inspired by a teacher who was a, a role model for us or something like that. So in my point of view, um, education is about transforming students so they become different. Now, how can we do that? Well, part of that is giving them facts and knowledge, but that's a very small part. On Friday, tomorrow, I'm interviewing, uh, the uni gets together, um, some of the people that really like teaching get together once a month. And tomorrow I've got a group of students coming along who just went through our last COVID term, and we're asking them questions about how it went and their suggestions for how we should teach differently and what their classes were like. Rather than, I'm really proud that we're doing this, rather than just imagining what it was like for students, we're actually asking them and listening to them. And I've done pre-interviews with everyone over the week, and it's interesting, I'm hearing the same thing from every student, and it's this. The academics have come up with a lot of questions that they want me to ask the students, it'll be a Q&A session. I'm gonna ask them, the students are gonna answer, but I know the answers now, I can give you a, a heads up. You're welcome to come along and inspire on the session, session two if you want, but I'm sort of spoiling it to you now by telling you the, what's gonna happen. Do you want the videos to be long or short? Does it matter about the camera quality? Should we have a background or a virtual background or real background? Should we use Zoom or Teams? Should we, um, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, millions of questions like that about process and procedure and things like that. And the students are all going, nah, I don't care. Yeah, okay. Or they have opinions, but they're not very big. And when we ask the students, well, what's the most important thing? What's the best predictor of if you um, felt that a class was worth going to, if it changed you, that you enjoyed it, that you feel the thousands of dollars you paid for it were worthwhile? They're never picking procedural things or technology. They're picking, or oh, can anyone guess? Does someone want to say it in the comments? Let me have a look. I'm looking on the chat. What do you think is the most important thing to the learning of the students across all faculties? Connection with the teacher. Yeah, Chris has got it. That's right, the teacher, David. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly it. The teacher and the connection. And that, and that oh, Pawsey, that's right. Um, the teacher, if you're connected with the teacher, it inspires you. So what they do like is if the teacher does a Zoom session, even if it's from the kitchen and the audio is crap, they love that and they can talk to the teacher or the teacher's at least spending time. And if the teacher does a really fancy, expensive video that they produce at home and it's taken them hours and hours and hours to make it and there's a huge production team and, it's, and they put that video up, the students hate it. They actually hate it. They say, I try to watch it and then I just get bored and switch off. But somehow having a real human being talking to them and connecting to them grabs them. And this is what I think the plus time means. It doesn't just mean plus time. It means plus learning, plus connection. And learning isn't dissemination of facts. Learning is establishing a relationship and connecting with each other. And they feel they're connecting to that person. And I said, how's it different? How's it different if a teacher um, gives you a video of them teaching something or they're physically present? You know, how can that be any different at all? And the students say, well, if I don't understand something, I can ask. And I said, but if there's 300 people, does anyone ask? Isn't, aren't you too shy to ask? And they say, yeah, I don't ask but there's a possibility of asking and I can see other people asking and somehow by the teacher talking and being there and going to that trouble, I know they care and I know I could ask them for help and that's enough. Then I feel it's almost like they've inspired me to want to learn it and I don't want to let them down. Okay. It's all about the connection, Jason. Yes, that's absolutely the idea. Yeah. Yeah. For Pilates. That's right. You, Anything, if you're trying to teach your own children stuff, it's exactly the same. I don't know why we know it instinctively in our small local lives, but when we go to a big expensive institution, we forget it. And we think university is all about the mechanics and the rules and the regulations and the, the standards of the web page and the, the quality of the video and so on and so on. We just think it's all about this stuff that really, oh, it's nice. You know, given the choice between doing it this way and that way, probably this way is slightly better than that way, but it's completely swamped by whether there's connection or not. Okay. So, um, I guess the other example is learning the piano. You can't learn the piano from watching a video of someone playing the piano. The other thing you need to do is not only be, feel motivated and inspired, you've actually then got to practice and do to transform yourself 
you can't, it's not enough to listen. You have to absorb it into you. You have to carry it out. You have to replicate it. We know this sort of through apprenticeship models and so on and so on. And so on, and so on. Okay. So the human element, all important in teaching, even though, of course, with technology and budgetary problems and things like that, it's very tempting to make everything tech, see technology as a solution to education. But I think it is a solution only insofar as it enables connection to larger groups of people and efficiently, not to replace the human connection. Pilots say the same thing, by the way. When I um, talk to test pilots, and I'll talk about them in a sec, uh, about how they deal with crises in aeroplanes and things like that, and and when something goes wrong in an aeroplane flight, this is in my security teaching now. Um, every single pilot puts it down to training and practice. And I was at a CASA conference recently where the regulator was there and um, various technology people were there and they were talking about ways of autopiloting planes and devices and safety devices on planes. And the pilots kept standing up and I guess they've got a vested interest in this, but it was genuine. They were saying, we have to keep a human in the loop. It's a human in the loop that saves us here when things go wrong. Okay. Um, so the, I wrote down four things that I think the students need. They need to be practical. They need to be fun. They need to feel worthwhile. They need to feel what they're doing has meaning in the world. Freud said that. He said, why do we live? What's a good life? What's, what motivates humans? And it's two things. One is feeling you have meaning in your life, that what you do is meaningful. And the second thing is feeling you're loved, that you have connections with others. And I think in teaching, we do both of those simultaneously. And it has to have the human element. That's what I think the recipe for teaching is. Technology is just an enabler. I know we, we love technology and I love technology uh, and that's our strength, but it's also our weakness because sometimes like the machine that goes ping, <laughs> we just think the technology is the solution to the problem. It's an enabler. If we forget about that, we could fall in love with the technology and we all know how disastrous that can be. That is, to quote a, a, quite a famous person, that is how perfectly nice people end up creating a surveillance state because we love the technology and we're not thinking about the bigger picture. So, why am I saying all this? Because maybe you don't care. Maybe you're interested in running a business or you're looking after your um, particular domain at a university or a large org and uh, you, you get the students after we've trained them. So, well, why is this interesting? Well, I sort of think it is. And I sort of think it's helpful for you to know this um, because, because of this three-way split that I talked about at the beginning and because of the fact that we live in different countries, you, me, and the students. And I think the easiest, no-brainer way we can improve things and get all this incredible benefit is if we break down the barriers and allow interstate travel between these three countries, these three states. So I'd like to talk about those three parts. Um, the why it's useful for teachers to interact with students, why it's interesting for you to interact with students, and why it might be interesting for you to interact with academics. And I wanna give you examples of each. Um, now, I'm, I'm noticing the time. I think I'm going okay for time, but I wanna leave questions at the end. Uh, if anyone, ah, oh yeah, someone's, Paul said that already. If anyone wants to ask questions that are really short, because I only just glance up at the screen, type them in, and if they're only a line or so long, I can answer them as we go. But I assume people wanna ask questions at the end, so I will try and cut it short. I did, though, promise, I was going to talk about the NHS and WannaCry, but I might not talk about that. Instead, I'll just briefly talk about this book that I uh, am really, oh, I don't know if you can see it because of the thank you background. If I move it, you might think it's alive and you might be able to see it. It's The Right Stuff, a uh, uh, book by Tom Wolfe. Um, uh, he's not a test pilot himself, but he was fascinated by the guys that were selected to go, the first American astronauts, the early selections, and the process NASA went through to test and train the people that were going to be astronauts. Uh, they took um, uh, military fighter pilots, basically test pilots. They were the main people that got to be um, uh, the, the astronauts. And he goes through and interviews everyone inside. Well, lots of them are dead, of course, because of the nature of being a test pilot, but he interviews their families and friends and relatives and things. And he wrote this very interesting book. And I'd always wanted to read it because part of the security engineering that I teach to my students is about incident response, how to deal with things when things go wrong. And I really like, I think computer security hasn't been around long enough that we've got a good history to draw on here to make our learnings. We're engineers, so we don't just make things up and think, oh, that's a good idea, let's do that. We really have to draw on actual practice and learn from past mistakes. And in a new field where you haven't got a lot of past mistakes, uh, yeah, I, I think I've said before, someone might have heard me say this, but I love it so much. Um, a friend of mine that was a farmer told me this. He said he was just learning to be a farmer and he was quite hopeless at it at first. But after all, he became quite good and he's successful now. And I said, how did you do it? It must have been hard. You switched from being a financier to a bank, uh, to a, a farmer. What did you do? And he said, oh, I, I learned one thing. He said, the best way to learn is through mistakes. And then he said, the best mistakes to learn from are other people's mistakes. 
<laughs> so uh, I think this is how engineering as a discipline proceeds. So The Right Stuff is a book um, really about how test pilot, the test pilot culture and how then uh, leading into the NASA safety culture. Um, and it's very interesting, A, because the NASA safety culture eventually failed with the two space shuttle um, accidents being uh, sort of physical evidence of that. Uh, and it's interesting seeing how it failed, something that started off so idealistically and optimistically got perverted and, and went bad without anyone noticing incrementally. Uh, and, and even after one mistake, um, and, and when it was evident that it was wrong, it was still able to happen again uh, a long time later. That's a very interesting failure of process. So I, I like studying that and our students, the students and I study that. But basically the idea is we look in other fields to find mistakes made in other fields so we can apply them to our new field, security engineering. One of the things we look at, we look at nuclear safety, we look at um, test pilots, we look at all sorts of things. But here's the thing. It's a great book. Tom Wolfe talks about how when a plane's about to crash, the best test pilots, you can hear them calling out sometimes frantically, I've tried A, I've tried B, I've tried C, until the last second of the crash from the voice cockpit recorder. They're going through checklists and there's a lot of study on checklists. And if you're a safety scientist to know about that, checklists can be quite wonderful because they stop you. From um, and that was an example of the fighter pilot, of the test pilots going frantically through their checklists until the very last second. Those that were good, those that didn't sort of, um, you know, go to pieces. And he calls those that are good, those that are the ideal test pilot, those are the, are the ideal astronauts. He says they have the right stuff. And this is a book trying to work out what the right stuff is. And I think in security, we started with this same idea. We have this idea of the right stuff. This, it's almost a hacker culture. Um, to be a security person, you have to um, have certain attributes and think in certain ways. And there's this sort of security character. And I really believe that's true. And this character is quite hard to get. And it's hard for universities to teach it because it's got a lot to do with questioning and not accepting. And the way we work and teach at scale at universities is having large number of like uh, battery chickens, battery students jammed into large theaters that we teach in parallel. And it's very annoying if they all want to be treated individually. We don't really have enough time. I have a budget of uh, one hour per student essentially marking over the whole term um, and then one hour at the end. So two hours in total. Uh, so, you know, they could blow that just in one two hour argumentative session and <laughs> I don't have any more budget to spend time with them. So it's very convenient if everyone's compliant. And I think if you watch how kindergarten teachers work, that's how I learned to teach. By the way, I sat in on lots of classes of friends who were teachers and kindy teachers impressed me the most. Um, but really a lot of what they're doing is just getting people to shut up and obey and comply and conform. And there's no coincidence, I guess, that students wear a uniform, really the process of kindergarten turns people from being fun, uh, fun loving, crazy kids that are, you can't control like cats into compliant people that will stand in a long line in assembly and not say anything for long periods of time. Just a year later, uh, I wish I could get my children to do that. But you know, I, I'm not an institution like a school, but the school has essentially, uh, through conformity and all sorts of things, a bit like an industrial factory, somehow made everyone comply and conform. And so and that lets us do things at scale and has all sorts of benefits. And without that, we couldn't have had probably the industrial revolution and all the massive education revolution we've got. So it's a good thing in lots of ways that we can do that, but it's a bad thing for security because the sorts of people I want typically, um, and that, that go on to win us prizes, or well, win themselves, I keep saying us, I, I revel in their, their glory, but I absolutely cannot take credit for it. They are much smarter than me. Um, those people tend to be misfits that don't fit well in that environment. And you probably know them. You might even be them. Uh, the, uh, they, if someone says, do this, they do that. Or they say, why? Or they say, someone says, don't touch this. I say, oh, I wonder what happens if I touch that. that that's the sort of thing I want. I want my students to be rascals. I want, I want them to be good, ethical people. I don't want them to be dicks. But I want them to be uh, people that, I want them to be Socrates, essentially. People that always question and challenge and test and are a bit annoying. But because of that, they spot the thing that everyone takes for granted. They see the flaw that's in front of everyone, the emperor that has no clothes. You need to see that because that's, that's the weakness in security. So if you can't see that, it doesn't matter how polite everyone is, you, you're insecure. So unis are hard. It's hard for us to teach such people at a university. Um, that was such an interesting story. I forgot the conclusion. And the conclusion is this. The right stuff was all about this sort of culture of being a rebel. We've recently started thinking about sending people to Mars. And there's been a lot of research into how people can go on such a long trip and how people can be isolated. And we're sort of seeing that in COVID now. I sort of think this is all Mars preparation that we've been going through. Well, it turns out that for a short period of time, you want your astronauts to have the right stuff. 
but for a long period of time, and the Australian astronaut talks about this a lot. I say Australian, I'm doing the same thing, and I, I'm pretty sure he's American, but he was born in Australia or has passed through Australia at one point or was related to Palak or something like that. That he said that, um, look for a short trip to the moon and back, who cares? You can be whatever. You know, you just need to have these technical skills. But if you're going to be locked up for months or years in a small space with a small group of people, then the skills you want and that you need to have are social skills and connection skills. And the groups that survived are the groups that um, operated effectively as teams. So when I said a student plus time becomes you, here's the time plus time thing. It's not learning a whole lot of facts, so that's part of it. It's actually learning how to get on with other people and how to be a good team player and how to not just think of yourself, but think of the greater good of the organization. So it sounds terrible to say it, but this sort of culturation, this becoming a professional essentially is a really important skill. Now you don't get that by me standing up and saying to you, you must become a professional. So this is my challenge. And now we get to the crux of the whole talk. How can I train people to be security people? How do we do that? We've been doing it now for 20 years. So, so what do we do? It's a dilemma we've always had because we need them to be rascals, but we need them to be professionals. We need them to be respectful and obey the law. We need them to have a sense of national pride. I don't have done that. haven't done that well enough. Most of them go over to the States. Hardly any of them go into the military. A success for me will be when I get most of my students staying in Australia and actually doing stuff that's good you know, for society rather than just good for big companies. But um, how can we give them good values? How can we make them good teammates? How can we make them good professionals? How can we make them advance the profession rather than just their own career? Um, uh, how, how can we make them that they're the sort of people you'd want to employ, that you'd want to have in your team, that you'd want to have as your boss, that you, you'd want your children to have as their boss? So here's how. I think it's breaking down the barriers. So what we've done for 20 years is exactly that. And the reasons the students do so well, and, and the reason I keep saying it's not me, is because it's not me. I get industry people to come in and teach them. I get you to come in and teach them. The students see you. And I cannot stress so much, too much, how important that is for the students. So we have guest lecturers taking most of our courses. We have guest people turning up and giving inspiring talks. We do projects with companies where the students go and work on a project at the company. And then when we evaluate the project, we get the company, they do a presentation to the company, to the senior execs in the company, and they do a proper business presentation. And at the end, we ask the company what they thought. I mean, I'm there too, marking and watching, but essentially what they're trying to do is actually satisfy a real customer and do a real thing and advance a real org. And they soon notice that people that are, um, you know, dicks, I don't, I don't know how to say that more nicely, people that are jerks, uh, actually don't work well and the companies don't want to hire them and actually their teams don't do so well. Uh, but people that are team players, they end up being really effective and amazingly effective. So if now we go back to the military thing that I was talking about at the beginning, the war games. Sure, the civilians in the teams ended up beating the military teams. But here's something I got when I started interrogating, or not interrogating, but asking more closely questions to some of the people involved. The civilian teams had a much higher rate of kinetic advance advancing to a kinetic situation, you know, kinetic warfare, uh, physical violence. They reacted more emotionally and they got angry at the other side and they escalated. And the military teams often avoided conflict, the professionals, but the students were fighting and killing. Not the students, the industry people, you know, the, the non-military people. So yeah, they might've won the war game, but you know, if you know Sun Tzu, and I'm sure everyone knows Sun Tzu, and, 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 and rightly so, there's a bit of fun poked at Sun Tzu now because it's such a meme, but it's a meme for a good reason. That guy was brilliant, had so many good ideas. And the main idea that I think that inspired me when I first read The Art of War was this idea of there's no point in winning the battle. Your object isn't to win the battle. Your object is to win the war. And it's even probably better to lose the battle and win the war than win the battle. In fact, if you've ever seen the film, The Mouse That Roared, sometimes it can be better to lose the war and that would actually advance your country. So I guess if you become emotional and engaged and just want to win, 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 you might win in the short term and you might be more aggressive and escalate things. But in the long term, um, that actually doesn't advance your campaign. To win the war. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely right. Good faith policy. Oh, Oliver, you're there, Oliver. Oh, hey, a former student or current student. Are you a former or current, Oliver? I guess we could call you former now. Um, lovely to have you here. That's fantastic. Uh, the Right Stuff is a great film as well. Yes, thank you very much. It is absolutely. Everyone should definitely watch that. And Apollo 13. So here we go. Um, 
what are the three, I can see we've hardly got any time left and I wanted to just quickly tell you the three collaborations that I think are possible. Academic to IT industry. So Peter Cooper, our amazing CISO at UNSW, I'm sure you all know him and if you don't, you should go up to him afterwards virtually at least and say hi, I assume he's here. And if he's not here, reach out to him. Such an inspiring man. Um, I want him in front of my students whenever possible because I want them to be a bit like him. Um, now, Peter, uh, uh, the question this year in the security exam was how do you secure, how would you um, trick the CISO of UNSW into clicking on a link in an email uh, or clicking on a link I can't email or web page was one of the two and um, and then people had to do recon on him and work out how they'd trick him and they were subject to the good faith policy and all our ethical standards and so on and so on and so on and he's um, and the best ones the best six which we've just worked out now we just had the exams are going to him and he's going to judge the best one so he's sort of embedded in our course so he's breaking down he's typifying the breakdown between industry and academia and i sometimes am on panels helping it because peter uh, and tim i guess a lot of you know tim i don't know if tim's here our cio um are really open to interacting with academics so we sometimes help them on their panels or work with their uh, industry consultants that come in to, to solve security related problems and those guys come and help us with things and expose the students to them and that is how the students get my notion of the right stuff uh, that is how the students get the values i want because i wanted to see people in the industry rather than hearing me talking um, uh, guest lectures they their staff come along and do guest lectures industry orgs send along staff to be guest lectures so the breakdown not i guess just between it at uni but it everywhere is um uh, we get lots of people from the different banks mainly the combank but actually other banks help out too um we get lots of people coming in from actually lots of different organizations that just want to sort of give back and pay back and they come and talk to the students and that's how our students learn not just the technical skills but they learn the mindset of what it is to be a security engineer um, we at the end of the course the students uh, or at the end of some of the courses the students have to put together a reflective journal of the things they've learned and the things they've done and demonstration of the key skills they've acquired over the course we call it a job application they actually have to write it like they're going for a job and they have to put in it um we give them the job the job ad and they have to show how they meet the criteria and give evidence for that and then i actually get industry people to come in and imagine they're interviewing these people and these are the applications we've been sent in and who goes on the shortlist so one year I want to get, I haven't done it yet, but I want to increase the involvement and even more and get the industry people to come and talk to the students in advance about how they select people and what they look for. Um, so otherwise we have this terrible disconnect. I teach them a whole lot of stuff, then they leave, then they come to you and you have to unteach them a lot of things. Um, surely we'd both benefit if we could bleed the two things into each other. So that's breaking down the barriers between IT and academia. Please try at your own universities, reach out, come and reach out to me and I'm, trying to reach out to other unis as well. Let's work out ways we can do it together. But if you're at a uni, working at a uni, and you're not being friends with your academics, it's just wasted opportunity. Work out a way of doing that. They're, some of them are crazy, absolutely. But probably some of you are crazy. But on balance, most of them are really nice and trying to do the right thing. So just keep reaching out. Understand they're a little bit different at first, a little bit weird. Forgive them for all their badnesses because the goodness, uh, the potential goodness benefit is huge. Now I want to talk about the um, looking at the time ticking down, the barriers between academics and students. Breaking that down, I guess I only want to spend 60 seconds on this to say, A, it helps me to break down the barriers between me and the students because it keeps me young. They are so awesome and inspiring. I want their energy and I'm like a vampire. The more I'm near them, the more, I don't know if I'm sucking it from them or if it's like well, there's a greater total, but somehow that energy and hopefulness and optimism that fills me with such hope. I get that just being around them and you will get that too if you get your staff to interact with students. We'll talk about that in a sec, uh, literally a sec because I'm almost out of time. Um, alumni, if you do break down the barriers between you and students, then they'll come back as alumni. And so many of our courses are taught or tutored by alumni because they had a great time here and they want to pay it forward to the next generation. Uh, one year, I remember I was teaching first year programming and I worked out that half our tutors came from Google. They were Google engineers that when Google used to get 20% time, they'd come back. They didn't charge us any money because they couldn't for tax reasons for some reason. So the uni just turned up having all these free tutors who were Google engineers. And our first year computing students were taught by the very people they wanted to be in the future. Uh, and that is just an example of the community we built between us and the students, helping future students as well. Uh, and the last one is for academics. I feel if I'm teaching 300 people, it's not one teacher and 300 students. That's very awkward and difficult. It's actually 301 teachers and 301 students, if you do it right. So breaking down these barriers and, and actually interacting with the students, not viewing them as aliens, but instead viewing them as collaborators, colleagues, and people just like me, but plus time, once I was giving a lecture, I was explaining it really badly. Uh, something to do with 
Diffy Hellman or something, I think. I can't remember what it was. Some concept I was explaining badly and I felt jostled. And I looked across, I was writing something on the board and stuffing it up. There was a student next to me on the board writing something else. And I looked at him and I said, hey. And he said, hey, yeah, I just thought I'd write. I had a way of doing it. I thought I'd write that up too. Best lecture ever. I just sat down and looked at it and applauded at the end. He did so well. Uh, and then last of all, I only got seconds left. Oh, I get 42 seconds left. Thank you, Douglas. Um, breaking down the barriers between industry and students. So what are the advantages for you? Well, the HEROES program, if you've ever heard of it, run by Anatoly Kovalov at UNSW, uh, was when students could pitch for projects to IT to improve the student experience. And then the IT would, ment they'd do a big pitching session, we'd pick the top three, or IT would, and then they would work with mentors from IT to implement them. And we got so many fantastic student-facing solutions worked out, we got to use their energy and ideas in innovation and craziness, like in the war games, but, but by mentoring them with senior people, it wasn't a crazy thing with lots of bloodshed at the end. Uh, it turned into a really productive thing inspired the students, lots of them stayed on. Uh, if you collaborate with students, it's a pipeline of students that might come and work for you because once they start seeing you, they'll see your values. If they don't see any of that and they leave uni cold, what will they pick on? They'll pick on prestige, that sounds like Google, or they'll pick on salary, um, but actually they should probably be picking on values and happiness and culture and all that sort of stuff. But how can they know that unless they've been with you? So again, we should bleed those two things together. Um, there's lots of other things, except to mention, oh, at UNSW, we do all these projects with IT. Um, at the moment, students are or just about to start a course where we'll design solutions for one of the problems IT is currently facing, and they'll actually use it. It's no use to me if they don't use it. So it'll be a genuine project with genuine industry outcomes. And we've done that for lots of industries too, not just in uni. So that's the third benefit, I think, of breaking down the barriers. And I can see I've got zero time. So let me just say, uh, in conclusion, that, um, it is not hard, it is not a big change to stop viewing us as three different states. It's not big to say, hmm, maybe we're all the same in some, maybe what unites us is greater than what separates us. We're all in it together, but how big is the we? And I think the we should be quite big. I think it should encompass those three groups. Um, and if you do that, then sliding doors moment, who knows what the future will be like? You can keep doing what you do now, You'll never even notice the possibility that might have been there, but it would take a very small change and I'd love to help or work with anyone that's interested in exploring this because it might sound crazy. You could be in a very different future and about connection. Well, I just wanted to say, uh, if we help the students and collaborate with them, we lead them forward into a bolder future. It sounds idealistic and stupid, but actually that's why it's great to be a teacher. And if you get involved with the students, it will inspire you and your staff. And so that phrase from that famous nursery rhyme, take my hand off to never, never land. I sort of think that's what we do as teachers. Okay, thank you very much, everyone.